handwritten. So I can introduce. Thank you, Jen. And then we'll get to the plant drawing after our talk tonight, since we do have a few people on Zoom. Um, such a good drawing. All right. Okay. April is a native plant enthusiast and naturalist with a passion for wildflowers and wildlife. She moved from Ohio to, to the Claremont area in 2006 and has since enjoyed exploring all of Florida's natural areas. April cultivated her love and knowledge of native plants as a long-term employee of Green Nile Gardens Native Plant Nursery. April will be presenting a program on Florida native plants for butterflies. This discussion, this discussion will include native butterfly larval host plants that are utilized by more than one species of butterflies and butterflies that will use more than one host plant or a generalist. Larval host trees for Lepidoptera, a fun bit on the caterpillar roundup at Green Nile Gardens Nursery and how to successfully incorporate the appropriate plant species into your landscape for optimal use or optimal success. To move the screen, you can just hit forward. I know it kind of sucks you have to stand back here the whole time, but you got it. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So this is a short program and we're going to leave time at the end for questions and conversation so we can all talk about our gardens and what's going on with them um, and just have an open discussion. So this shouldn't take too long. Actually, let's go back to the first picture. So if you guys can see here, this photo was taken at Pear Park in the fall. Um, Pear Park is a park in Lake County. It's a Lake County park, actually, uh, and it's quite beautiful. It has a lot of open meadow spaces, and I highly recommend um, checking it out in the fall. It's just stunning. Okay, so this is just the definition of a larval host, and we all know that, of course, uh, butterflies use host, have host plants. They lay their eggs on them, but they're not the only ones. A lot of things use plants. Um, you know, if you're doing uh, milkweed for monarchs, and you know that aphids also enjoy milkweed, vice versa. So it's not just um, insects, it can be several things. All right, we'll quickly go over the milkweed that's available at Green Isle Gardens and most everywhere here in Florida, a swamp, butterfly, and aquatic, depending on uh, the habitat you have. Um, full sun, dry, sandy soil, you will want the uh, butterfly milkweed. If you have irrigation and shade, you would want the aquatic milkweed. If you have irrigation and sun or part shade, you can go with the swamp milkweed. And um, they're all usually available. So this is just, this doesn't even get to how many categories we actually find on our plants. This is just one morning, one roundup. Um, so in the mornings, Caitlin, mostly, and a um, few other employees will go out, they will scout the plants, they will scour them, and they will take all of our categories off so that way you guys can come out and purchase them so that way we have plants available. Um, and so we have plants planted around the outskirts of the property, um, and we have, you know, just crop designated four caterpillars to eat. So as the ladies go around, they round up these caterpillars every morning, and they transplant them to other plants. Um, and get them off of the actual production plants. Um, it's quite fun, but um, you know, if this isn't done, we can walk out in a matter of days and we can have 600 plants eaten down to absolutely nothing. Total no. Um, you know, so it has to be maintained. Yes, Jackie. Can you you can. I find when they're in their first install, it's kind of iffy, and sometimes they don't make it, or they'll just try to go right back to the original thing they were eating on. Um, but once they're, you know, their third or fourth or your fifth install, they do quite fine, and they can be transferred to any other mobile species. Um, but most of the time, and yeah, and that's an issue. Um, you know, we can move them a hundred feet away, and they will just they'll try to crawl back to the original thing that they were eating. Um, you know, so 
they're probably picking the same caterpillar off of the same plant three or four times. <laughs> but that's okay. And I don't know if we have, if these are all monarchs or not. Yeah, they look like it. So sometimes we get queens too, and you can tell the difference between the monarchs and queens by the filaments. So monarchs will have uh, four filaments or antennas, two at each end. Queens will have two at each end and then one about three fifths up the body. Um, so they'll have six and that's how you tell the difference between a monarch and queen cat. Queens have a little bit more red on them also. Okay, and passion vines, another extremely common butterfly gardening plant. Um, we try to have as many species available as possible in the native. I think there are six native species and we try to keep five in stock um, at all times. The only one that we've never sold is the sex flora, which um, grows in extreme South Florida. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, all right. Um, so, of course, like it says, I'm not going to read the slide, but we all know golf, Julia, and variegated fritillaries, and the zebra longwing. Um, so the zebra longwing is our state butterfly, and it is actually an important butterfly. It has an extremely long lifespan. They can live nine to 10 months in their landscape. Um, so it's kind of nice to provide the best habitat possible. Um, some scientists think because zebra longwings will also feed on pollen and not just nectar that that further um, extends their, their lifespan and that's why they are able to live so long um, versus some other butterfly, they have a much shorter lifespan. Um, so this is our zebra longwing here, the adult butterfly and then the caterpillars and these two were kind of racing to the top there. We thought that was an interesting photo. Um, and while I leave this picture up, I just want to explain something about um, symbiotic relationships between plants also and what we've noticed at Green Isle Gardens. Um, so if you plant a fire bush, fire bush get quite large, usually they'll top out at 10 to 15 feet or so if you let them. Um, they get quite large, they are a favorite nectar source of the zebra longwing, as you can see there in the photo. And it's true, they love the long tubular flowers. If you plant a corky stem passion vine with your fire bush, or if you already have an existing fire bush in your landscape, plant the corky stem under your fire bush. The corky stem will grow and join itself in the fire bush. It will provide shade that the zebra longwing adult butterflies need and the caterpillars. Um, it will provide the larval host um, food for the caterpillar and food for the adult. So those two plants planted together. Um, provide food for the entire life cycle of the zebra long. Um, not only that, but the female butterfly, she um, exerts less energy flying from host plant to nectar source. So, um, you know, she's able in her lifetime to lay more eggs because she's exerting less energy. Um, and you're She's more likely to stick around in your yard versus flying off to your neighbors or down the street in search of food. She has everything she needs in one spot. Um, we have done this quite well. We have a head grow of fire bush at the end of our yard at the nursery. They're about 15, 20 feet plus. Um, Corky stand growing all in them. Then summer, probably June, if you walk up, there are just hundreds and hundreds of golf fritillaries. You can peek your head inside the shrub and they're in the shrub. I mean, it's amazing. It is a, a great relationship um, and it, it works well. And we also have a fire bush in the porky stem here available. And I don't know if you guys want to pass this around, but we have a call for a little bit of color on the porky stem fashion, right? <laughs> and that's the caterpillar that you see in the photo here, but the passion vine in the photo is actually um, Passiflora incarnata. And so here, this is a the firebush photo, or our liner trait inside of the greenhouse. So these are golf fritillaries, um, you know, in the greenhouse. Um, having fun with the fire bush. <laughs> and then the other photo is just, Mac and I were having this discussion earlier. 
And if anybody could help us out, it would be greatly appreciated. So we found this caterpillar munching on our passion vines, but it doesn't look like a fritillary, a variegated fritillary, a julia, or a zebra longwing. Um, so we're unsure if it, or it's just a weird freak of nature, but if anybody has any insights, please let us know. Um, we cannot figure out what this guy is, but he loves passion vines. Anybody? No? So our theory is he's a golf fritillary that, um, you know, just decided to be a little different. It's pretty cool. I, I thought it was variegated also, but they have very long uh, spikes. All right, so next we'll talk about our sulfur butterflies. And here's a list of some of the ones that can be found in Florida. Um, we do have some non-native sulfur butterflies in Florida that were introduced, um, but that's okay. So the first plant we'll talk about is partridge peat. And this is probably the most popular plant. It's a little sensitive right now, a little shy. And so this guy grows in our harshest conditions here. <laughs> It's not much to look at right now. The leaves are folded up kind of like the mimosa. They're very sensitive and they don't, uh, you know, they're touchy. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so this plant here uh, really packs a powerful punch. It does host a lot of butterflies, not just sulfurs, as you can see here on the list. Um, it likes very dry, sandy soils, full sun, very hot conditions. It does quite well. Um, it reseeds readily. It grows like an annual. Sometimes you can get two years out of it, but usually just one. Um, and then you'll have to rely on its seeds to kind of repopulate where you've planted it. It grows to about three to four feet and it's quite stunning. I think it's quite wide too. So this is a Serenus blue. This little guy is one of my favorites. He's a generalist and will use several species of uh, native plants, including our frog fruit, which is right here. And I don't know how many of you have um, actually planted frog fruit. Not only is it a great larval host, but it's a great pollinator plant. It produces flowers almost year round. The great brown cover grows quickly. If you live in a, in a in an apartment and have a patio, you can put it in a container, you can put it in a hanging basket. It does well in all of those um, conditions. And it's a larval host to about four different butterflies. And I would say uh, around August or so, our white peacocks are just all over it. I mean, by the hundreds. There are some pictures of some cloudless sulfurs, some other sulfurs, all right? Pipe vines are one of our prettiest butterflies in the state, um, but it is hard for us to provide the habitat that uh, these, these are woodland butterflies. And a lot of us want to plant our Aristolochia, um, you know, in our yards, and we don't live in woodland situations. Um, so a lot of times we'll plant our pipe vines and then we end up with the other guy, the polydomus, the golden swallowtail. Um, that's the one you will find most commonly here in Central Florida especially in suburban areas. Um, so pipe vines and swallowtails frequent, uh, frequent woodland habitats. They like um, a little bit of shade, you know, tall uh, canopies in the trees, things like that. Um, you know, so if you don't have those conditions, um, it's kind of hard to attract them. This here is a polygonous caterpillar. Um, and you can tell the difference between the polygonous and the pipe vine by the patterns on the skin of the caterpillar. So a pipe vine, so if you look closely, the polygonous caterpillar has this like zebra pattern on its, um, on its body. The uh, pipe vine swallowtail is just plain purple with the orange spikes, it won't have that pattern. And of course, a little flower there, it actually looks like. And you have to be careful when you're purchasing pipe vines. A lot of us will, uh, have the urge to purchase these pipe vines you see at flower shows and garden shows with these big showy flowers, big beautiful leaves. Please don't do that. Those plants are toxic to our butterflies. They truly are. Our butterflies will uh, use them. The caterpillars will start ingesting the leaves. They can't handle the toxicity and then they die. 
So this is another woodland butterfly, and this is a spice bush swallowtail. And believe it or not, she uses more than just the spice bush. Um, so she likes to use things in the Loraceae family, um, red base, swamp base, sassafras, you know, you name it. Um, and again, uh, aside from the red bay, the red bay does pretty well here in, you know, sandy conditions and sunny conditions. But the swamp bay, the sassafras, and the spice bush, those are all woodland species. So again, um, we can all try to garden for butterflies, but we have to keep in mind that the, the habitats of these butterflies frequent. Um, so if you're planting, or if you're trying to attract, attract a butterfly that uh, frequents large, sunny, open meadows, and you live in a suburban area full of tall canopy trees, no matter how many larval host plants you plant, you might not attract that butterfly. Um, you know, so that's a chance you have to take. Or quite the opposite. They can eat your plants down to nothing. Um, you know, it's just the chance you take. Um, so here, in Central Florida, I would probably go with the Red Bay, the Persia Bourbonia. That is probably the one you'll have the most success um, actually attracting a spice fish swallowtail with. Um, and if you're going to go with the spice bush or the sassafras, keep in mind that these are more northern species. They like a lot of leaf litter, they like acidic soil, they like shade, they like moisture. So if you can't provide those things for these plants, um, I probably would steer um, clear of them. So here is a spice bush fruit, fall color, and flower. <clears throat> the tulip poplar is just kind of there. That is a larval host for the eastern tiger swallowtail, and again, another woodland species. So here we have the swamp bay, the sassafras down at the bottom. Sassafras has uh, variable leaves. A lot of them are mitten shaped, like the leaf in the middle, um, but all three are shown here just to give you an idea. Um, and then we have the swamp bay on the right. Okay, so this is a picture of a spice bush caterpillar uh, just before pupation. And they do turn, this picture was actually taken at Green Isle Gardens by Nick, who used to work for us. Well, he still does. But, um, and this was crawling up the side of a pot. And maybe 10 minutes after this picture was shot, he started forming his chrysalis. It was pretty cool. Okay, so another one, false metal. If you have a back corner or just a spot that you never go in, that you don't care about, you can just plant something and let it go, false metal would be the plant to choose. Um, this plant, it's, it's quite vigorous. It can grow a lot. That's why I'm, I suggest you put it in a back corner, but it is a great larval host plant. It truly is. Even at the nursery, our entire crop um, you know, you'll just look at it. And so a lot of these butterflies will hide during the day. They will, um, especially the Red Admiral, she will, um, the caterpillars will roll themselves in the leaves to kind of shade themselves from the sunlight and just, you know, for cover. And um, if you look at our crop of false nettle, it's even starting right now, you'll see all these rolled leaves and you look inside and you see the caterpillars and it is quite amazing. It's one of my favorite host plants. I just wish it wasn't so vigorous. <laughs> um, it likes moist soil, but it is drought tolerant. Um, so if you plant it and if you can, um, you know, get it established, the seedlings will uh, survive on their own in dry conditions. Um, the, the important thing is to give it a little bit of shade. It's the sunlight that really uh, makes it unhappy. And as you can see here, these are the flowers and, the, and when it fruits, the fruit is all along the stems also. Um, and one plant will release thousands of seeds, but that can be a good thing. So um, here are some more butterflies. These butterflies are more woodland species. If you guys notice, we have a lot of woodland species here. Um, that's why it's so important to protect our woodlands. Um, so the hackberry is a very important tree. Um, some of these, like the Tawny Emperor, actually, or no, the American Snout, this is an only larval host. So without this tree, that species would cease to exist. And that can be said for a lot of things. Um, so the, there is actually a family of butterflies, and they're called the hackberry butterflies because of this tree. It's a great tree. 
Um, so when you're out hiking, this picture kind of, you can kind of see it, but it has the gnarliest bark. And sometimes it'll have like um, what looks like, you know, bird hole where but it's, a bird has been pecking at the bark, but it's not, it's just the bark of the tree, or it will have what appears to be spikes on it. It's The bark is variable, it's very attractive in the landscape. It is a great tree, uh, very formal, has great curb appeal. Um, so if you could plant a tree in your yard or are looking for a tree, I would highly recommend the hackberry. Is it a percentage forest? It is. Yeah. I think so, yes. I think the hackberry is one of those that um, you can push beyond its boundaries because it will grow pretty much anywhere in a variety of conditions. So I have a hackberry, but it must be a different species because the bark doesn't look like that. Yeah, it can be variable. Um, it can be really rough. Um, it sometimes in really mature species, it'll look like a woodpecker has just drilled holes all in it. Celtic um, lavagata is um, sugar berry, I believe, right? Well, can anybody, are you looking it up, Andy? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Okay. I do believe Celsius Lava, is Celsius Lava got a sugar berry or hack berry? You know, the, the names, the common names, there's a lot of Sugar berry. Thank you. Okay, so American Elm, another gorgeous tree with great curb appeal. Um, you know, these, these are stunning trees. Um, and they're just not valuable to butterflies. They're valuable to pollinators and birds in general. I mean, and that could be said with all of these trees, like the hackberry tree, it has all of us butterflies using it as a larval host. So imagine the birds that are coming in, feeding off of those. Um, you know, you see the fruits that it produces. Um, you know, it's just a very powerful tree. The tree is a powerhouse. All right, so the American elm. Again, this one likes a little bit of shade, but it can handle full sun. Um, I would probably irrigate it or keep it well watered the first year or two. Uh, they seem to do a little better with that. Again, a great host tree. All right. So the peacock. This is one of our probably most common butterflies, but um, you know, has is a is a generalist and bee, and it will larva on more than just these. These are just some of the native plants. It uses non-native plants. It uses a lot of our little weedy species. Um, I would say at the nursery we find that the peacocks use the water hyssop the most. Um, we could have you know 600 frog fruit and only 10 water hyssop. They would devour the water hyssop before anything else. Every year they go after the water hyssop. They don't touch anything else until the water hyssop is gone. So um, I would say their favorite is the hyssop and that's just something that we've noticed over the years. All right, our buckeye, another generalist, has several larval host plants. Um, I think at the nursery, the one it uses the most is the wild petunia, the Ruellia species. Um, that's the one I see the caterpillars on. Um, you know, so uh, I used to do a lot of cuttings at the nursery and when I would go through plants, you know, we would find a lot of caterpillars on the plants and the wild petunia was always covered in buckeyes. And not the just the dry twin flower, the oblong folia, but our lakeside twin flower, the uh, Dicarista fumistrata, um, is also utilized by them. Okay, false indigo. So this is a nice woodland shrub. It gets, or, small tree, I would call it a shrub. It gets to be about 10 to 12 feet, give or take, um, likes part shade. Um, it is drought tolerant. Once established, it does quite well. They're flowering now in the landscape if any of you have them. Um, and it is also a great larval host. And not only is it a great larval host, but you see these uh, flower spikes here. When those go to seed, they bring in the birds because um, they're just loaded with seed and it's a really good size Capsule, birds just seem to love. All right, so this is a black swallowtail caterpillar and a black swallowtail female. Uh, you, you can see she is actually laying her eggs right on the plant. 
here. And this plant is uh, water cowbane or water dropwort. Um, Oxyphilus, no, Tidemania filiformis. Um, and it's an aquatic plant, but it does handle irrigation. We've grown it with just irrigation. So um, sometimes some people will turn away from plants because they think it's aquatic or it's a wetland and they don't have the conditions for it. But if you, a lot of these plants will grow in your landscape with just irrigation. Um, so this plant gets to be about three to four feet tall in flower. When it's not blooming, it's just grass-like. And um, the black solitelles come in, they use it. The caterpillars, they cannot devour this plant. That's my favorite thing about it. The, the epidermis or the, the plant itself is so tough that the caterpillars just kind of put little nits in it and they can go through all in stars without putting you know, a dent in the plant at all. They form their chrysalis right on the stem of the plant. Um, it, it's just fantastic, you know. The caterpillar lives its entire life when the plant forms its chrysalis, you know, and emerges all from the same plant with um, little to minimal damage to the plant. This is my favorite butterfly. <laughs> the red spotted purple. She is quite gorgeous. Again, another woodland species. Um, she likes black cherries the most here in central Florida. I've never actually seen her larval on a deer berry or a willow, um, but we don't have those too often, nor do I have any in the landscape. Um, so what I find most interesting about the red spotted purple is the males uh, not only use nectar, but they'll use dung and rotten, rotten fruit and things like that. Um, as food sources and they puddle a lot. So I don't know if you've ever uh, happened upon a bunch of butterflies puddling or swallowtails puddling in general, but this is one of the species that puddles. What does that mean? Okay, so, so puddling is where uh, butterflies like say have moist sand. Um, butterflies will gather and, and they'll get their, their water and their nutrients from that. Red banded hair streak. Again, another generalist. She will use the wax myrtle, sumac, and oaks. So we have this vine here on display. And this, what I like to say, it gives a uh, big bang for your buck here. This is Harry Pod Cow Piotl Grow in sun or shade. If you want flowers, of course, you're going to have to put it in sunlight. Um, so not only does it attract the butterflies listed, but it will also attract certain softer butterflies. Um, it's quite vigorous. It's a great vine to put on a trellis or a fence vine. Uh, the cold knocks it back in the winter months, so that helps keep it in check. It doesn't get too vigorous. A nice dry sandy soil. It can grow moist acidic soil. It can grow in dry leaf litter, flat woods. I've seen it. It's just about every habitat ground naturally on its own. It's a great little vine. Okay, and this is just for note taking, or if anybody wants to uh, snap a photo, it's just our swallowtail butterflies and some of the things that they use. Um, I think we pretty much went over all of these. So the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Um, and if you, you, if you notice, there is a theme here with these guys. Um, you know, you can tell the woodland butterflies from, you know, open meadow butterflies and those that use little, uh, like the white peacock uses the little um, flowering herbaceous plants. Um, you know, so try to think about your habitat, what you have, your area, and then plant appropriately to attract those species. And then as you build, maybe introduce some of the um, you know, other host plants that you might not find commonly in your area. Okay, so keystone species are important. They are just food sources, uh, plants that are important to all wildlife, not just butterflies. Um, and here are just a few. And you can see in the photo here, this is Solidago sempervirens. And um, there's a monarch and a, a bee on it, using it at the same time. So usually when solidagos are in flower, which is 
fall, unfortunately, not all year. Um, they're just covered in pollinators. And then when they go to seed, the birds move in. So these are the three species we carry at the nursery, and these are the three species most commonly available. Another keystone species, sunflowers, and those are, you know, helianthus. And again, think about your habitat. We have sunflower for very dry, sandy soils or wet, you know, sunny conditions, wet, shady conditions. Um, and then others like asters, those are just great pollinator plants in general. They, they attract not only butterflies, but they attract our bees and other pollinators. And blueberries, those are most important for our native bees and our bumblebees. Um, so anything with that upside down bell-shaped flower is ideal for our native bees, especially bumblebees. Bumble, female bumblebees are out in the early spring. They are building their nest. They need a lot of food. Um, so it's important to plant early spring flowering things like blueberries, for instance, um, Virginia willows. Um, there are a lot of things that our blueberries use, but um, extremely, or that our bumblebees use. They are important. So now um, we will have a little conversation piece where we will ask each other questions. We'll talk about what's in our gardens. If anybody has a question about a specific plant um, and we'll just have a little bit of an open discussion on our gardens and what's going on with them. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned earlier the red bay is being a larval species. Yes. What, wasn't there a problem with the red bay in the past, like with the fungal? There, there is an issue, actually. It's, it's moved on beyond the red bay. It's actually a red bay called Laurier Gate. It's a red bay and Rosa BRP. It's an insect, um, and it, it's only spread a fungal. Disease and it's kind of wiping these trees out. And it's, it's hitting the bay trees first, but there have, have been some studies where it has now moved on to quite commercial sassafras in some areas, um, which are, you know, closely related. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's something to be concerned about. Um, but again, um, hopefully it's not in the nursery site, it's uh, just happening in our uh, natural areas. Unfortunately, so maybe we can help go on and keep these species that depend on these trees going if you know we start planting them in the suburban areas. And unfortunately, suburban areas outweigh natural areas, so it is kind of up to us now. Hopefully, some of these species. Yes, I think some of the, the, the red bays that are purchased at most of the nurseries uh, lately. Um, are all inoculated. Um, I think so, so. Uh, they were selected uh, from natural areas uh, that they are immune to uh, fungal diseases. And we will do evidence to those out probably uh, eight, ten years ago. Yeah. So most of the trees in the nursery business now are all immune to it. I have not seen it nor heard of it in the nursery trees so far. Yes. Uh, I have a lot of uh, the passion flower, and my, my question, my, my question is on that. I have four different kinds. I have the pale and the purple and the tuberosa. Is it? They they all sort of have grown together. Do the caterpillars and butterflies care? Should I keep them separate, or is it okay? That it's just one big mass of, of plants. I think it's okay to kind of let them grow massively like that. There, there are no controls in nature, um, you know, other than winter or casualness. Uh, you know, so uh, this winter, your your incarnata, your big purple passion flower will probably die back, and that will kind of um, leave your corpse stem more exposed to kind of grow further. Um, I do know, just make sure that there are some tendrils. Um, so at the end of the vine, there is also like a little tendril coming off, and that is how it attaches itself. 
So our zebra longwings actually like to lay their eggs right on that tendril, not on the leaf itself. The golf fritillaries will kind of use the leaf itself. If you if you actually watch the butterfly, um, the fritillaries will just lay right on the leaf. Where is this? Whereas the zebra longwings will come in and very delicate, very delicately too, find the tendril. And I have watched them line their eggs all up on the tendril. And that's how they do it. Um, so just make sure you have some tendrils available for the zebra. They tend to like that. Any other questions? Yes? Um, once a spot, it will stay. So the, the plants that you plant, uh, you will have to keep water until they're established. It is the seedlings that will be able to adapt and be able to handle that soil um, right naturally from the get-go. But but the adult the mother plants, you will you will have to baby, you know, and you'll have to let it go to flower and then seed and then rely on that next generation to be able to sustain itself. And then after that, I think it would be um uh, carefree. But it sounds like a good corner. And maybe leave somebody. Well, it, it gets midday sun, but it gets more than afternoon shade. That would be ideal. Yes. Um, this is really crazy. I hope that a lot of people thought I'd get in their yards. Um, since then, I must have got a field trip to see what's going in the field. Of, it does, and it's and also a marble. And then uh, another thing is that it's really should get at the back corner of your yard if you have a back corner. It's probably responsible for the most uh, sort of pollen and nectar statewide is Paul Madden. Yes. They bring in the good pollinators, not butterflies. They bring in good guys. I love them. Yes. yes. Uh, so, in the thistle um, that he had mentioned, is also a marble host for a little tiny butterfly called a little metal mark. And it's like a little orange and brown um, butterfly, but quite stunning. Um, so not only is this a little great pollinator, but it too is a little host plant. And the painted lady. Yes. In my yard, I have a little beauty of trophy and scorpion. Yes. And the pollinators just love it and it's moved around over the years. Yeah, so uh, scorpion tail uh, produces a lot of seeds. Um, if you notice every single one of those white flowers along that uh, tail there uh, produces a very viable seed. <laughs> and yes, and yeah, they get smooth and round. But, but again, that's another great plant. Um, we have questions for shady area, shady dry area that that scorpion tail is fantastic for. And the fact that it flowers every single day of the year. You know, you can't beat that. Um, I'm really excited to spot that Barbie on the movie because I feel like the movie is a gateway plant. I, 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 I spent a lot on new faces and I was wondering if we could just maybe mention other insects that are also using milkweed for playing to eat it. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, just so you know, people can know how to manage that. So, um, yeah, so we're fortunate that we can't just pick and choose what, you know, pollinators or what insects will larval on our plants. You know, um, that's of course, you all want the pretty butterflies, but, you know, like milkweed is a food source for a lot of things. So a lot of people will see them uh, 
Fortunately, there aren't any on this one. Uh, the yellow aphids all over your milkweed plant, those are only under aphids. They're not native, they were introduced. Um, so a pest, even more so. Um, you know, and uh, it will kind of line the plant, uh, especially the axis of the plant and then the axis of the, um, the leaf axis here, and it'll uh, just kind of clump on top. So there are several methods you can use to rid yourself of aphids if you're wondering. Take your finger and just wipe them off. That's the best method. That's what I do. Um, if your infestation is serious, um, you can clip the heaviest infested areas off and just, you know, toss that clipping. Check it for aphids and caterpillars first. Butterflies don't seem to care. Um, another thing is you can use soap and oil, um, but keep in mind that especially oleander aphids, they build tolerances fairly quickly. I've worked in a greenhouse for several years. You can use a product once. The second time you go to use it, that next generation that comes the very next day is already tolerant to what you eat. Um, it, it's insane. So hand cleaning is the number one method to rid yourself of aphids. It truly is. Um, another thing you can do, um, you can get a bucket of water, put on a pair of like plastic gloves, take your finger, get the aphids, wash your hands in the bucket of water, go at it again, so that way you're not staining your hands, you're not walking away with this big yellow gooey mess, which is, I'm sure some of you have done. Um, it's a lot easier to use gloves in a bucket of water. And a lot of times, um, if your plant, you know, is kind of tall, you can kind of go like this, angle your bucket of water up and switch, you know, the, the terminal, the top of the plant into the water, and that will kind of wash them off too. And that's a safe way. And then there are milkweed bugs um, that also will suck your plants dry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> They're just terrible. They're orange bugs. And the thing with milkweed bugs is if they even think you're coming close to them, or even if the wind blows a little bit, they'll drop to the ground and they'll hide. Um, so you might think you have like two milkweed bugs on your plant because you're seeing them. But the second you walk up to your plant and your shadow hit the plant, there was probably 10 that hit the ground to hide. Um, so you can uh, step on them, crush them, leave them be. They, uh, because they eat parts of the plant, they have very high toxicity levels, so there aren't very many insects or birds that eat them at all, kind of like monarch caterpillars. There are some paper wasps will carry milkweed uh, or monarch caterpillars off, but that's about it. So is the answer to then put the milkweed in a net? Um, so that can help with the milkweed bugs, but the oleander aphids are just going to go right through. I mean, I don't know how small of a net. I've tried, you know, the like the, like the butterfly eating the nets. No. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't recommend um, the breeding nets at all. That's kind of just harbors disease and um, just not a good natural way to go about it. Keep in mind that when you're raising butterflies, you're raising bird food too. Yes. Um, so, plant more larval host plants, you'll have more caterpillars. Yeah, that, that's my answer. Um, you know, so how, I don't want to offend anybody, but um, I think I just stated it, that um, caterpillars are nature's food source. That's why there are so many things going after them. Um, you know, so when, when we're raising caterpillars, and that's fine, I understand the hobby, I get it, it's fun, I've done it myself, but when we're raising them and we're like hoarding hundreds of caterpillars on our lanai's and, you know, think of the birds and not only the, but I mean, you know, there are generations that will depend on just like one plant, like, you know, one, one bird family will need that tree or that plant to feed its entire nest. 
um, you know, so just try to try to share, you know, and try not to think to try not to get too upset about it. I used to be the same way. And I've even asked Mark, like, spray that nest, you know, the wasp nest. And, you know, and then finally I got to the point where I realized that, you know, they're just trying to eat too. And there are things that will come in and eat the wasp. So the larger your wasp population grows, the larger your bird population grows. It just, it spreads exponentially. So just let nature run its course, even with your oleander aphids and stuff like it might seem like it's getting out of control, but if you actually step back and do nothing at all, you'll start getting, you know, your ladybugs and other things like that. They'll come in, um, your lacelings, and they will take care of your aphid population for you. Um, you know, it just depends on when and how long it'll take, but it will happen. Yeah. Is it okay?